video games and horror. My favorite kind of entertainment. With new games constantly coming out, there is always something interesting to play. If you casually browse one of the many gaming platforms like Steam or Itch.io, chances are you're going to find something specifically made for you in mind. From late night shift retail to spooky Japanese folklore, there really doesn't seem to be a limit when it comes to what falls under the horror umbrella. The horror scene grew in popularity over the years, and with it spawned a lot of really strange but interesting subgenres. You have your Survive the Night in a Haunted Restaurant, which obviously started by Five Nights at Freddy's, and one of my most favorite subgenres, the PSX Horror, which seems to gain a lot of movement as of late. One of the more strange er subgenres that I've seen, I didn't even realize was a thin and still I started working on this video. It doesn't even have an official name or anything, but it's a subgenre I decided to officially dub as the top-down schoolgirl horror. I know, it sounds like a pretty strange subcategory, but when I started just listing all the games out in my head that I played previously, I was surprised to see how many of them actually fit in this category. From older titles like Ebb and Misao, to newer titles like Kyo's Adventure, Anne, and Purgatory, and there is probably a few more that I'm forgetting, and the reason I bring it all up is because today we're taking a look at one of these top-down schoolgirl horror games. It actually came fairly recently, and I decided to highlight it because the gameplay and story differs quite a bit from similar games of its kind. The game that I'm talking about is Last Light. Out of the box, you get this pretty intro snippet letting you in on the story. It follows a schoolgirl named Lumi. While sitting in class, she gets a message from a group of friends about playing a scare game. It cuts to Lumi being out in the woods with her group, only for them to mysteriously vanish. Before she realizes, panic sets in and she finds herself in an abandoned hospital. Dropping into the game, the setting is as gloomy as you'd expect out of a dark and trashed hospital. Lumi's friends contact her through group chat on her phone, and they let her in on how to play the scare game she was involuntarily nominated to play. It consists of collecting student IDs scattered all around the hospital, starting with the first one, which actually belongs to Lumi. The little group of friends swiped it away from her when she wasn't looking and hid it in the basement. Lumi making her way to the basement actually serves as a tutorial on how to play. Lumi will stop and take a look at a map. These maps are present at a few locations on each floor to help you navigate around. In addition, there are lockers all around the hospital which you can use to hide. To hide from what though? What could be in an abandoned hospital that is so bad? Turns out the hospital isn't as abandoned as we first thought, and this place is swarming with ghosts. The hospital has three floors, and each floor hides two IDs for Lumi to find, for a total of six students. While most ghosts will attack you on sight, the others will either float around or just stand there. Those that stand around can interact with Lumi, giving her objectives to do around the hospital. Some of these objectives are strange to say the least. But if you come through and act on the ghost's requests, you'll be awarded with a student ID. Lumi can interact with a number of things by getting close and clicking on them. You can open cabinets or dig in trash piles to find either a candle or a bottle of salt. These items will aid you in getting around the hospital. Candles can be used to light a small area. In addition, they will reveal certain ghosts which are invisible in the dark. And you don't need to worry about running out of candles, as you can use Lumi's flashlight to reveal the pesky ghost too. On the other hand, salt bottles are harder to come by. If you get your grabby hands on salt, you can pour it on the ground. Any fast chasing ghosts that come in contact with salt will be slowed down considerably. However, it will only cover a small area. That's why from the very beginning, the game teaches you to pour salt in tight spots, leaving the ghost no choice but to go through it. Aside from utility items, you can also find keys which are highlighted differently. You can collect keys to unlock doors that will make navigating around the hospital an easier task, or you can use them to open up rooms that have notes. The notes you'll find across the hospital will shed some light on the ghosts that inhabit this abandoned place, and man do I love finding these notes. They're easily my favorite part of the game. While most notes look like a kid's diary, there are some that are just complete eye candy. They give off this RPG horror vibe 
times. While we're on the topic of things I love, can we just take a moment to appreciate Lumi's animations? Whenever she's having a dialogue, she's very animated as a character, being mostly scared and timid. Just look at her when she's ramaging through a cabinet. And she always tucks her hair behind her ear when she picks up items. I mean, you can have Lumi just dig through a dead body and still have it look cute. You know, it's not surprising to see that the stronger side of the game's presentation is in the art department. Just one look at the development team behind this game and you can see it mostly consists of artists. Heck, even the game director is an artist too. The notes, the animations, the presentation. It's clear that the team who worked on this game put a lot of heart into it. And it really shows. I can go on and on about the art, but... It's not the only thing I feel strongly about. Creepy looking drawings are not the only thing you'll find in notes. I've already mentioned that some of the notes are actually diary pages of ghosts that haunt the hospital. And these pages contain some seriously morbid stuff. Like this one for example, there is a diary page about a girl who tortured cute animals because she was being bullied. She roams around the hall as this eerie looking figure known as the Wraith. Some of the notes will reveal a diary of a girl who wanted to surprise her friends. She hid in order to confuse her friends, only to see them all being murdered right in front of her. Being the only survivor, she couldn't stop feeling guilt over the incident, eventually leading to hallucinations of being stared at by the killer. That's this jumbled looking ghost on the second floor. She's known as the Banshee. I believe the character is eyeless as she couldn't bear the hallucinations anymore and gouged her own eyes out. Lastly for the unfortunate ghost, and my favorite one, Fire Demon. According to the diary, he definitely got the shorthand when it came to his parents, leading him to be obsessed with light, eventually leading to burning down the entire house just so he could have a little bit more light, burning himself in the process and leading to a world which would never be dark again. Any candles he comes in contact will give out immediately. These stories are so disturbing on so many levels, the more diary pages I've found, the more I got interested and worried to what the next one would bring. Some notes will shed some light on the ghosts you interact with to progress the game, but they usually contain hints about your upcoming task and won't provide much in terms of story. The abandoned hospital is packed with a plethora of notes to find on each floor containing a lot of information, though they don't reveal any about one important little girl, Lumi. Her story is told through memory flashbacks. Whenever Lumi helps a ghost out, it disappears and leaves a student ID behind. Upon picking it up, Lumi will remember something about her past. And a bit of a warning, they are really uncomfortable to watch. There is a kid with a large smile. He asks Lumi to open all the toilet stalls within the vicinity. When all is said and done, the boy leaves an ID behind. Upon picking it up, a painful memory wakes up within Lumi. In the memory, Lumi is doing her business in the restroom, when out of nowhere she gets splashed with a bucket full of water by another student who has been waiting for her. The memory identifies her as Amelia. On the same floor, you can find a boy with a duck mask. He drops the next ID, which reveals another memory about a boy named Ralph. In the memory, Ralph vandalizes Lumi's school bag and it ends with everybody laughing and Lumi crying. On the second floor, things get even weirder. It's where you'll encounter the Banshee for the first time. It's also home of Ellie. She's this creepy looking doll-like girl who asks you to retrieve a red bow. Upon bringing it back, you'll get another memory of Lumi being bullied by a girl named May. I could go on and talk about the other memories you unlock from the different kids, but I think you get the gist of it by now. Each ghost kid contains a painful memory for Lumi. At this point, we are getting into spoiler territory, so here is a fair warning to click away before we dive in. After doing one of two tasks on the second floor, Lumi will be greeted by a new face. In the first meeting, he says something very interesting. He points out it's not the first time he sees Lumi, and every time he does, she's crying. Fast forward to the third floor, and six other student IDs later, the group contacts Lumi once again, telling her to bring all the IDs to the morgue. After making her way there, Lumi is greeted with dead bodies scattered all around. These are actually the bodies of her friends. Wondering who could have done such a thing, the cat once again watching over Lumi urges her to think 
very hard and remember, this sentiment wakes up one final memory. In which Louis finally breaks down, her hands are covered with the blood of her so-called friends. But before she has time to take in and process everything she's seen, the wraith appears out of nowhere and catches up with her. And in her final moment, she is crying for help while being consumed by the cruel monster. Man, I can't help but feel bad for Lumi. She faced her fears in an abandoned hospital. For a scare game, she didn't want to play, mind you, only to be consumed at the end. Or the start? After being consumed, Lumi wakes up back at the entrance of the hospital. This time, it's locked with chains. And now credits roll. Yeah, the whole ending isn't any better. Honestly, it's actually worse. Does that mean Lumi's forever trapped in the hospital? It might seem like it. But after the credits roll, the game starts over again. Lumi's story is told through three different parts, which also means three different playthroughs. Let's do it. I didn't realize it at first, but the game reset at a higher difficulty. It actually switches to normal mode, which means the first playthrough was easy. Looking at the achievements unlock rate, it seems a lot of people missed out on the whole deal. Since then, the game was updated to have difficulties you can choose from, though I do have to admit it feels very odd having so many difficulties locked. The whole point of difficulties is so you can select the one you think is right for you. Oftentimes just having the hardest difficulty locked out, but still leaving you with two other options to choose from. I understand why they did it. The difficulty is directly tied to the story, and they don't want the player to skip ahead in the story. And also they had to add them to make it apparent that there is more going on. But I can't help but feel like there was a better way to handle it. An example I've seen from other developers is to move the end credits. Which makes sense, because we're all conditioned to believe something ends when we see the end credits. Making the player feel weird because something isn't quite right. Leading them straight back to the game. Only showing the credits when they solve the mystery. Usually dubbed in gaming as the true ending. I'm so smart. How am I this smart? The whole thing could have been avoided just by dropping the player straight back to the game after the scene of Lumi banging on the entrance of the hospital, making the player understand that there's more than meets the eye. It loses a bit of the magic the original idea of the developers had. It's not my only grievance with the game either. The magic is lost when you realize the entire game is exactly the same, just slightly more difficult. Which isn't a problem, but it does bother me that the difficulty seems more artificial rather than... by design. On your second playthrough, Lumi's flashlight will act up every so often, and to turn it back on you have to mash your left mouse button until it works. That novelty wears out quickly and ends up being more of a slight annoyance than anything. On top of that, ghosts from other floors will now be active from the get-go. It sounds cool on paper, but in reality, it makes things feel a bit too crowded. Having all the ghosts rampant when you start make each floor on your second playthrough play exactly the same, because the ghosts are no longer tied to different floors. It doesn't help that the harder third mode does nothing but increase the amount of ghosts either. I just can't help but feel like there is some wasted potential in these higher difficulties. A mechanic I would love to see which would be perfect for this game is invisible rooms. Just like the wraith is invisible in the dark, you can do the same thing with rooms that contain no light. And the only way to see what's inside is by having either Lumi be physically present at that room or light a candle to make it permanently visible. This is more fitting with the game theme and would enhance the main gameplay loop of exploring and using items, making it more challenging by design. Also making the later floors that much more challenging when the flame dude roams around and turns off your candles. There's so much more that could have been done with this idea to create a more dynamic and challenging experience. Aside from having some grievance with how difficulty is handled, it's actually not the biggest issue with these modes. There is something else that perks me up a bit, and that is the notes. While most are just lying out of the open on the floor waiting to be picked up, there are a few that will be locked behind locked doors, which you can easily find keys for and collect with no issue. I ended up picking up everything on my first playthrough for a total of 42 notes. After jumping to the second playthrough, 
there was nothing else to find. And it was the same deal with the third playthrough in hard mode. It feels like the developers didn't design around the fact that the game requires you to play three times to get to the end point. An idea I really like is having only some of the notes available for the player to find, depending on the difficulty. For example, you can leave a note in a place out of the player's reach, with no visible way in, with the only hint being a big sinister number two on the wall. That's a hint that in the second playthrough, new areas will be available to allow the player to reach the note. Which is fitting because of how the game manages difficulty and story. It sets a pace that is more in line with the game, as the player would be on par to collect all the notes in the final playthrough. This also synergizes with my difficulty suggestion of invisible rooms, as you can set up an interesting puzzles using this mechanic. For example, in easy mode you can clearly see where the node is, and on harder difficulty the room is now available but hidden from sight. And if players are having difficulty with finding that note, the game can simply stick a lit candle in there and drop the puzzle altogether. Getting all the notes on the first run may confuse the player, as it gives off the sense that you've 100%ed the game. That's how I felt when I completed my first playthrough, and only found out that the game had more going on after looking at the achievements. The main reason the game has you go again through the abandoned hospital is because of the different endings. Unlike the difficulties and notes which I've talked strongly about though, I do have even stronger feelings about the endings and the story as a whole. After completing easy mode, you get a bitter ending of Lumi killing her so-called friends and then being overpowered by the Wraith. After going through a second playthrough on normal difficulty and collecting all the student IDs, the group contacts Lumi again, but this time something feels off. Lumi makes her way to the morgue to find the entire group just as dead as she left them. This time though, Lumi has less of a reaction as if she's seen it all before, feeling very sad that she would commit such an atrocious act, wondering if she's the one who really did it. Lumi is finally able to leave the hospital, but it's still not the happy ending you'd imagine. Lumi is very sad about what happened to the group, saying such painful things, like thinking it's all her fault. And none of this would have happened if she didn't exist. The third playthrough on hard mode has you understand that it's all falling apart now. From the very beginning, the group chat is still corrupted from the last interaction. Lumi is no stranger to this cycle and she knows what happened. The bodies are gone. It turns out Lumi did not kill anyone. Kitty tells her she should be able to leave for real now and he's right. The Wraith is nowhere to be seen, and upon leaving, Lumi wakes up in a hospital bed. Lumi is alive. Seeing Lumi wake up in a hospital bed connected to machines has you thinking how'd she end up there in the first place? Something you could probably tell from the memories and even the gameplay itself. The bully and Lumi experience was pretty bad. At the third floor, one of the final kids you help is a girl named Ava. The memory she held was the most painful one I've seen. The whole group of the so-called friends are surrounding her. The group gets a nasty idea of locking her in such a way that she could not escape. And all you can see in the end is a locker shut tightly and the screams of Lumi begging to be let out. This traumatic experience is probably why she ended up in a hospital. It is unknown how long she's been stuck in the locker, but I can take an educated guess. At the scene where she finally wakes up, you can see her hair made all its way down her back. Comparing its length to Lumi's hair in the memory and abandoned hospital, you can see it's just short of her shoulders, indicating that a considerable chunk of time has passed. Knowing all this information makes me feel very bad about some of the things that happened during gameplay. Now I feel very bad every time a ghost is coming and I have to hide in a locker. And some notes have a serious dark tone with this context. There's a few cute notes that seem to be written by a girl that likes cats. I'm confident these were written by Lumi. Apart from being the only cute character in this game, the notes talk about Kitty, and Lumi refers to the mysterious cat as Kitty. There is a total of three notes written by Lumi, and it's the third and last one you get which rubs me off the wrong way. This is something I haven't mentioned, but the ghosts that you talk to are not Lumi's friends. 
If you interact with them a bunch of times, they will get fed up and outright kill the player on the spot. I'm bringing this up because Eva, the ghost with the memory of being locked in the locker, executes Lumi by making her belly warm. I can't shake the feeling that this piece is a result of the two things she wanted most. She was obsessed with Kitty and she was hungry. The ending scene has another part I haven't shown you. After Lumi wakes up and is alive, tragedy hits. The final ending piece is Lumi being stared at by Fire Demon and the Banshee, alongside the only real human, Amelia. I don't understand. The game has us, the player, go through hell with Lumi over and over again for this? I was curious to see how she's gonna break this vicious cycle that she's been stuck to. I understand not all stories have a happy ending and I'm okay with it. But I'm not okay with this. Even in the true ending, something good happens. Lumi wakes up finally. Something good! Instantly the game rips it away from us in a mere seconds in a 3 hour playthrough! It couldn't even let us have that! And as the player, my heart cries! I saw Lumi go through so much! There's another scene I've stripped from the second playthrough ending to not give away the whole story. In the second ending, Lumi starts casting doubt on whether she really killed the students. The fact there is a small chance she hadn't killed the students affected Lumi so much. The effects were so strong to the point she had a physical response that would eventually break her coma. Despite everything they've done to her, she believes they don't deserve to die. It shows how important this subject is for Lumi and what kind of character she truly is. I understand it's the developer's story, they can do whatever they want with it, I get it. But you also have to understand, I spent a considerable amount of time with Lumi, clocking in at 9 hours of playthrough and there is a hole in my heart. At no point did she stop taking in my player input. And through all this hell and pain she kept pushing through, and in spite of her traumatic experience, she didn't commit harm unto others, in extension proving she does not belong in that abandoned hospital. <sighs> and that's gonna be my closure. Lumi deserves the best. Lumi deserves closure. Lumi deserves to be whole. God fucking damn it, man. Kids can be really cruel. I really hope I don't have to review another horror game about kids ever again. <laughs>